Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our Designers for Learning Town Hall with Grace Centers of Hope. Today is Monday, September 29th, and our entire session today is devoted to responding to students' questions, whether they're here in our live session or questions that they've posted asynchronously in the discussion boards or through um, through email or whatever it may be. And so just to, as a means of introduction, we have Kim Phillip, who's here. Um, Courtney, I think, is also somewhere in here, uh, maybe on, on speaker with, with Kim. And then we also have Bonnie. I'm trying to get Bonnie's audio going at this point. I don't think she's got her audio. And then we've got, oh, probably half a dozen students, at least at this point, that are joining us. And hopefully others can join as well. Um, so I think it's always fun to start off on a happy, exciting note. And so, Kim, would you mind just giving me uh, or giving everyone else the same update you gave me a moment ago about how things went today with some of your students? Yeah, um, we had two students pass a question today of the GED, so that's really exciting. So right now, we have seven students who have passed 12 sections. Yay! Yeah, so that's exciting. And we have two students that are actually just one section away from passing the entire thing. Oh, that is so exciting. That's really awesome. Um, all right. Well, I don't even I can't top that, so <laughs> we'll just not get into the nitty gritty questions, I guess, as we go. Um, I just wanted to, before we jump into this, uh, this is actually for Bonnie's benefit, but she is saying in the text chat she can't hear us right now, so hopefully she'll get her audio going. But um, as everyone knows, the next deliverable that's due is your written design plan, but right after that will be a prototype that you develop using a PowerPoint template. And so you may be looking at the screen, and hopefully I should have asked, can everyone see this PowerPoint that's um, on the screen? I, I hope so. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so it looks, as you can see, quite basic. It's white with black font and aerial, aerial font. But this template I'm using today for our PowerPoint presentation is basically the same template you'll be using for your prototype. It is purposely basic because, as we've talked several times, our intention is to have a redevelopment of all these units as we move to a more robust platform, an e-learning platform. And so the best way for us to do that is to keep things concise and to the point and, um, and consistent. So um, this is what it looks like, and when, as you're moving forward on your, pro your prototypes, if you just keep an eye on the style guide, um, that will also be helpful. And I'll it may email out instructions on how to use this template, but again, that's a couple, that's the two, two deliverables down the road. Um, I just wanted to, to bring Bonnie and everybody up to speed on that. Okay, so let's jump right into it. I don't think we have Sandy on, but Sandy and Gilbert, I believe you two are um, partners. And so Sandy offered us, um, I think what's really helpful, if you go into the discussion forum, we have a resources section. And I encourage everybody, when you stumble on something that you find helpful, if you wanted to post it there for others, that would be really appreciated. And so she stumbled on this really nice PDF document, which is the GED standards. And it really helps when you're trying to figure out, um, again, putting your objectives together and as you're developing your, your unit, it really helps for some of those descriptors for what is considered passing and then not not passing on the GED. Um, and so, Kim, I wondered if this might be a good place to start. You and I talked a little bit about this. We have a lot of questions from the students um, asking about objectives. And so maybe if, if there are any students that are on right now, if you have specific questions about objectives for you, your units, feel free to unmute your mic and chime in. Um, but do you, ha in general, before we start, Kim, do you have any recommendations on uh, on objectives and how you pick the topics you picked? Well, maybe we could start there. The, you mentioned when we were, you and I were in the pre-call that um, you know you're getting a better sense of what the specific units are that you need developed. So why don't you kind of kick us off and talk about that piece a little bit? Uh, we chose the topics that we did because these are topics that we felt that we did not have um, sufficient resources for in teaching our students on these concepts. So those are why we picked those. Uh, and then we went through and did, um, we talked about objectives and we talked it over with Bonnie. And Bonnie came up with some very specific things um, in that document. It's Great Center's GED course module objectives. I don't know 
exactly where you have it on your website? Um, we have it in the um, section five, I believe it is under the jumpstart orientation. Um, okay. I think it's under, I, I'll go back while you're talking, I'll, I'll go back and double check. I'm pretty sure it's in, um, in there, but keep going. So those are just, those are the things that we wanted to make sure when they were done with the modules that the students should be able to do these things. These things are things that we know that they're going to be tested on. And like I said, we just don't have good resources for them right now in, in our resources that we're purchasing. So that was why we really wanted those developed specifically. So, okay, and, and I just to correct myself, it's section three. And maybe a good place to jump into this. I know Helen has some questions specific to her objectives in her unit. Um, it's under the, okay. the math and science. And so, um, Helen, did you want to unmute your mic and, um, and have a, a chance to ask Kim questions? And I'll pull up the ones that you sent in. I have them pulled up here. That would be great. Yeah, there you go. Here are your objectives as they're laid out. Yes. My topic is probability. And th the biggest question I have, and I'm sorry if I'm being dense, but I don't understand what is meant by recognize probability in context and explain probability in context. And so I'm hoping maybe you can give me an example of what is meant by that just so that I'm clear on what I'm creating. I'm going to refer to Courtney on this one because she is my probability expert. Um, so I think um, what this is referring to is um, sometimes when they take the test for like the well, math or science test, um, they will see things like permutations, combinations, probability, different kinds of um, statistics, and they kind of confuse what's what as they go. So they're, they have to think through, okay, what, what do I need to do a formula for this? Is this a probability question? Is this a permutation question? I think to just being able to identify, okay, I need to use probability versus the fundamental counting principle here. I think that's what gets them confused. Does that make sense? Yes, and and so um, the explain probability in context are should I have? I mean, should I be having them do that with a tutor or or what exactly? Is, I, again, I'm sorry if I'm being dense. I just don't quite get how that's going to mm -hmm. translate over into a GED format where it's not a verbal conversation. So I'm just not really clear what is wanted. Um, I think the biggest thing with uh, both of those, with using context, um, is using like real life word problems. Like in our our um, programs that we have, it will ask them like, um, there are you know so many big fish in the tank and so many small fish. What is the probability you'll grab a big fish or something kind of childish like that? So. So we can put it into a more adult context. Uh -huh. um, like there's an example on one of the practice tests where they give them a chart and they have um, like rainfall, different amounts of rainfall for different days, and they have to figure out probability from there. Um, so putting it in a context, in like a scientific context or a more real world um, question than something that we have in like our Aztec program. Yeah, so there are okay. couple, there's a couple really good things um, that Helen's bringing out in these questions, too. And she, like I said, she and I had an email conversation over the weekend going back and forth. And so it sounds like when you're talking about in context, you mean within the context of kind of a word problem, right? And, and, and also in a real world context that the student may actually encounter. So when we were going back and forth, we were talking about, for example, rolling a die, one die, and then you have two die. What are the chance, odds of getting you know, heads or if, you know, if you're flipping a coin, what's the chance that you're starting kind of simple and then moving moving forward. Um, and then when we were talking then about this idea of using the tutor, and that's kind of a, part, a second part of what um, I believe Helen was also asking, um, we, we were also talking about, in contrast to a purely online learning context where you, if the students were developing like e-learning modules, they wouldn't normally have the ability to have a tutor um, to participate with the students. So we also wanted to talk to you guys about adding some definition about to what extent should we rely on the tutor to be able to help the student? Um, should we reserve that more for, say, when they get to the point of doing a more complex work, you know, worksheet or something they might do offline and walk through the, the tutor with it? Um, can you guys give us a little bit of guidance on how we should utilize the tutor? 
Um, these will be modules that they will try and get through on their own, or should be modules where they can try and get through on their own, where they can go through and get some practice on these things, um, where they should be able to explain the concepts of which to use. Uh, you know, here I use this process because this was a simple, you know, simple event, or this was a compound event. And then they should be able to solve problems on their own. Again, in the context of a story problem. Okay. And so really I, how they'll see it. Okay. And so when I was talking to um, Helen about things over um, the weekend, so what about in terms of then the like grading the assessment? So say they're writing these explanations, they're doing these more complex calculations and come up with an answer. Because of the way we're developing the unit, with PowerPoint, we don't have a lot of opportunities for you know, really robust <laughs> question and answer type of grading um, online. So, can we rely then if they do come up with these answers, it would like you know they could print it out and hand it to the um, person that, that the tutor to help grade it. They would actually be um, probably printing it out and giving it to Courtney to go ahead and to correct. Okay. Um, we also don't have a problem if. You know any resources that we can, you know that we can use. You know, like if they want to do a worksheet, they can do that as a, a, you know, as a supplement. So they could go through and learn, and then they could do a worksheet. That you know, Courtney could go back through and correct. Right, and I think Helen, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's kind of where you and I were going with some of yours, um, where it might be. An easy process on a PowerPoint to have them do something on one screen and then give them a canned answer on the next or whatever it may be. But um, right. if you're as you're getting to more um, of the application piece of it, which to me means more the explaining and things like that, it um, for the way we're developing it, we may need to have that set of eyes to help grade the assessments and offer feedback. Um, so yes. maybe what is yeah. a recommendation then to the students would be to prepare a worksheet like that and then have some type of answer key um, and tutor guide or you know corrector or whoever's doing the correction of the work, something that they could rely yeah. on. Okay. That's perfect. If we can even have a key, they can go through and they can correct their own. That's true too. A self test, right? A self correction. Good point. Yeah, we have most of our students correct their own work. And if they get something wrong, that's when they will ask a tutor to come over and assist them or to work with Courtney. Okay. Um, so while we're on this topic, before we, okay, Helen had a other couple um, questions that get off in a little bit different area as far as the development of the unit. Did any other students have any questions as far as this whole idea of online versus then having kind of this blended opportunity um, with the tutor or Courtney or however we, whoever is doing it to do the grading or self-assessment? Does that help address some of the questions that um, that people were um, were having? Okay, it sounds like Greg had that similar question. And Bonnie, you know what? Bonnie needs a call in number. Um, I don't know if somebody can help me out. I can do that, but I'm having a hard time <laughs> multitasking. So if uh, if, I, if you someone could just send the, the call in number to Bonnie, that would be great. Um, but yeah, go ahead. You had a question. Go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. Um, hi, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm yeah. just wondering uh, uh, about the learners in Grace Center for Hope. Um, do they um, have access actually, um, access to form, kind of a regular access to computer? If, if, you know, if we, I'm thinking if we can have an online discussion for students or if, if it is possible or feasible or if they are likely to use that or what do you think about your learners? Yeah, these questions, that's a great set of questions to, to, to consider. We kind of went down this path a little bit last year, but we haven't talked about it much this, um, this session. Kim and Courtney, do you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of what ability we would have for the students to kind of even communicate a little bit, work to, I guess work together either in the online environment or um, offline mm -hmm. working together? Where they would be working together online to do what? I'm sorry, I'm not clear on this. So say you had two students that were about at the same level and they're working. I don't know how often this would even come up or if it's even that. I think we came to the conclusion before we didn't go down this path because your students are often at different levels and taking different parts of the test. So very rarely do you have two students working on the same module at the same time. 
But I think the question is, if, if that comes up, or, or would it be helpful for us to do anything where the students would work with each other as partners? Um, or is that something that it comes up so infrequently you'd rather us just keep it as an individual basis? It's definitely rare. Okay. Um, how about, like, I, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about the, like, online discussion forum. Like, if, if they want to practice um, some writing, maybe they have some topic and then students, they can um, write some short paragraph to respond, like a practice for, for their write, um, writing test as well. Um, is this possible or is... Um, I don't know. And I don't there, know. there are a couple good questions in, in here. First of all is um, the idea, again, of who is working together and, and um, you know, how you'd pair them up. Uh, but then the other issues kind of creep into the technology piece of it. And I think it's my understanding, Kim and Courtney, you, you really don't have discussion forums at your disposal that you're able to use, right? You don't have like an LMS system that you're no. currently using. Um, so, no, we don't have an LMS. And then let's kind of take it to that next level. How, with your learners, are they at a point where they, where they, they would be able to do this? Would they have ever had experience working with a, a pair, pairing up with a learner in an online environment like that? Like using, for example, using the discussion form like we have in our um, service learning thing. Would that? No. Be, so do you think that would be above something that they'd be able to get their head around even at this stage? I don't think they would have the opportunity to do this. Uh, they're all in one classroom. Right. And, and this did come up last time when we were talking about, you know, that we, I kind of go back to there's the three main areas of interaction that a learner can have. They can have it with the content, they can have it with peer learners, and then they can have it with the instructor. And so of those three, probably the least likely for us to really do much work with right now is learner-to-learner -learner interaction. For one being that the, the um, the learners are again at different levels, um, and yeah. so that that makes it difficult. And so we're kind of left with a lot of learner to content interaction, and then some degree of learner to instructor interaction through the additional feedback and the assessment grading and, and feedback like that. So that is our, I guess, we consider it a design constraint of what we're doing. These are great ideas. I totally see where you're going, and we attempted to kind of do, think through this last time we were working with Kim and Courtney. But it's, I, it's just not very feasible. And I think, Jill, Jill, I think you're finally on. Did you want to take a crack at answering or kind of giving some additional context to this idea of the learners working together and why that's maybe not something that um, we're pursuing right now? Absolutely. And I kind of want to build off of what Kim um, said to us um, in our last meeting. It's really important that we're designing these modules that will sort of mimic and prepare these learners to take their GRE. And so it's really important that as everyone went through the Jumpstart orientation materials, they took some of those practice GRE test questions that we had available. I think it's more important that we're incorporating interaction where we have those checkpoints throughout the module saying, you know, let's take a minute and answer these questions. And we're developing those types of questions to promote, you know, learner to um, content interaction that are going to mirror similar questions that they could be expected to, to have for the GRE. And so I think it's great to do the discussion forums and all of that, but again, we've got the design constraints. I think we've got technology constraints um, that we're faced with, but again, they're not going to be expected to do discussion forums um, when they take the GRE test, so it's more important that we're gearing um, our instructional design um, towards what they're actually going to be expected to do um, once they complete the modules. It's the GED. I know this, is, this is Bonnie. Can you hear me? Yeah, Bonnie, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, one of the things, uh, while it definitely has to be instructor to content, is that, that uh, students who are in their designing can also provide either under something called uh, a hint or a model example or a worked example, is that when students are asked an open-ended question and they have no way of checking it except with their tutor, which can be very time consuming, is that what can be done on the design end is to develop a worked example of a, something completed or partially completed. So uh, the practice would be partially co completed so that they could complete sections of it, such as in the probability one. Uh, but uh, then a worked example as has been shown by research that when students especially are in a learning uh, 
at this level where they're not graduate students, you know, they're not experienced college students, they need to see whether it's an essay or a worked problem of how it really is a, you know, a correct way. Not just a yes, no correct answer, but I'm talking about an entire example. Okay? Yeah, that's great. And um, I, unfortunately, it sounds like Zoo can't, um, can't see or hear us right now, so she's going to catch the recording for the rest of the answers. But she answered, asked some questions in the discussion forum, and Kim had the opportunity this morning to respond. So I'm not going to spend time now going through them, but the screen that I have up right now are the questions that she asked. And if you go into the discussion forum, Kim had the chance to, um, to answer those, so you can peek over there. Um, and I think, Gilbert, uh, you had a, some questions. Did you want to... Do you want to give it a Yes, yeah, so if you could go back to the slide that you have uh, Sandy's questions on. Sure. I don't want to repeat her questions, so I okay. we're kind of working off of Google Docs and uh, okay. collaborating there. Okay. So that uh, okay, I see that she's got a couple of questions. Yeah, the the calculator question. Uh, did we answer that already? No, we didn't. Um, but the, okay. Kim and Courtney, I, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to let you guys. Uh, I'm sure you do definitely know the answer. Are, are, what's the difference between using a calculator in practice and then in the test? And then also, at what levels do they have access to, to calculators, both in practice at your location and then how, how things transfer then when they're actually taking the test? So if you guys could take a crack at that. Yeah, here with us, they use an actual physical calculator. Um, when they the practice test or the official pretest, they use the calculator that we have here as well. The first five questions in the actual test for math, they're not allowed to use a calculator. When they take the actual test, they have a calculator online. It, is a, it looks the same as ours, but it's an online calculator that they actually work in. So that's the only difference. And, so and are, they, are they familiar with how to use that calculator? Do we need to include some sort of uh, uh, hint or lessons on how to, do, how to use that calculator online? No, there is a tutorial that's available for them. Um, okay. By the time they get to that point, they're actually pretty good at pointing and clicking and things like that. We have not had anybody who's really struggled with using the online calculator. Okay. Because it is the same exact one that they physically use. The only difference is it's on their screen. Um, and I think Sandy also had questions. Um, Can I ask a question about the calculator? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Please. This is Helen. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. I see on that slide it said something about Helen note the relevance to Unit 6, which didn't, uh, mine is Unit 6, but I'm assuming what was meant was that the calculator can be used in the probability section. Is there a place for, and you may have already said it, a place where we can access this calculator online so I can see what buttons are going to be relevant to the probability topic? Yeah, if you, I, when I was poking around, um, when Sandy asked the question, if you Google, and I can also, you know, post it in the discussion forum where, where my link is that I found, the GED offers a tutorial, and then it will show you a screenshot of what the cal calculation calculator has, and then describes what functions it has. Okay, so just Google the TI thirty XS, and then GED, and it's like one of okay. the frequently asked questions within the GE Testing Services website. Um, and okay. I'll, I'll make sure I also post that in the uh, forum because I did land on a link that looked pretty helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think those were the only ones that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I heard somebody say something. Sorry, um, I'm not sure. This is Courtney. Um, I'm not sure who has combinations and permutations, um, but we teach them to do combinations and permutations without replacement on the calculator using stuff like the probability button. Okay. So that's something important to know. We don't teach them using the long formula because they don't need to know because they'll have full access to the calculator. So that's whoever um, has that. They just need to know what N is and what R is, and they can just like pretty much punch it right into the calculator. I think that's Sandy and Gilbert, right? That's correct, yes. OK, great. Um, and then um, this, has quite, this question came up from Sandy, and then actually from many others, is this whole idea of prior knowledge. And um, let's kind of circle back to one of the earlier slides I, we, we 
glossed over. Um, I don't know how familiar folks are with, uh, if you go to the college and career readiness standards of which the GED test is based, um, they do a, a, an alignment with K-12 education. And so, and, and Courtney and Kim, we can refine this if we want, but up to this point, we've very much been focusing on this level E, which aligns roughly with grades 9 through 12. And so when we were thinking about things such as baseline, reading levels, things like that, we were assuming the students were at least able to complete or be at a level D, which ends at grade 8, and, and then moving toward this level E. And so uh, we talked a little bit before about the standards that Sandy brought up for um, the GED testing standards. There's also um, a, a link down here, and I'll, I'll make sure everybody gets a copy of this PowerPoint presentation where all these links are present, but the um, college and career readiness standards do a really nice job of trying to help us get our heads around uh, where the students, again, making this assumption of where, where our learners are at. Again, we can't, we can't possibly hit every letter, le learner at every p potential level, but we have to kind of start someplace. And so we're very much focusing on this level E. And so Kim and Courtney, mm -hmm. how, does that, um, how does that work now? That was always our kind of marching orders going forward. Should we continue to assume that we're working with students who are basically reading at a grade level 8, 9, um, and, and that's kind of a, a good benchmark for us? That is a good benchmark for you. Um, what we've realized is that when we, if we have somebody below that reading level, we really can't put them into our GED program. They need a remedial program. So we just started that as, uh, as recently as last month, that if they're below that level, we have to do some remedial work with them uh, all of our online learning resources, all, uh, even our GED book, is uh, to probably written to that ninth grade letter or level. I mean, and so that's kind of the reading level question, and then the the questions then that are also coming up pretty much for each and every unit is um, that prior knowledge assumption. And so, any thoughts on that? And certainly this is something you, you deal with when you're sitting working with individual students. Could you kind of run, run through that again in terms of um, where, where our student designers should be targeting and focusing things as they're starting to develop their units? I think it's gonna depend, it's gonna depend. On, depend on what we're talking about. I would assume that they have very little prior knowledge. Okay. Okay. So what I what here's let, let me kind of get on my mini soapbox just because this comes up a lot and I personally find this a, a helpful thing when we're when we're, we as designers are kind of stuck with like okay where do I go first? And so I put in a link to um, it's uh, David Merrill is uh, kind of the grandfather <laughs> a grandfather in our field. And um, back in 2002, he published an article in one of our premier um, academic journals, ETRND. It's part of AECT. And um, it's his first principles of instruction. It's very much, it's very Gagne esque in the way he approaches these learner interactions in, in terms of what your instructional strategies are. And so um, when I was responding to students over the weekend, I was sending them copies of this. And I would just encourage everybody, if you haven't read this article, it's not a bad place, particularly where we are right now in our design process, to pull this up. And so his, I'm not going to go through it in detail now, but certainly I'll respond to any questions anyone might have after they've had a chance to read it. Uh, but I often joke that this is kind of the 80-20 rule of instruction. Like if you hit these five things, which I'm considering like kind of the 20% of all the potential things you could, you could do as you're having your learners engage with the content, you're probably hitting 80% of the things that are effective to help the learners um, master the content that you're having them work on. And so it starts with having like a problem-centered or a task-centered um, instructional scenario. Um, there's activation, which gets to what we're talking about right now, where you're asking them to draw on real-world practical knowledge that they have um, experienced in the past and so on. And then you incorporate your demonstration, you have them work on application activities, and then as kind of a parting shot, you um, have them have this rolled up into integration that they're going to use, you know, in this, in our case, when they actually go to do the GED test. So that it will be look like there are some, the activities you have them do will look very much like what they're going to be faced with when they're doing the GED. So if you take a peek at this, I think it, it's, it helps me personally when I get to the point of designing something where I'm like, okay, what do I do now? How do I start this process? Where do I 
start getting my um, instructional strategies pulled together. And I think it's going to be really helpful. So, and, and, um, and why I'm saying this is, is one of the main reasons we do this design plan is you have to start somewhere. And so, as Kim and Courtney are, are saying, at any one time, they don't know what the learner is going to be like that, you know, that they're working with or coming in. And so you have to, at some point as a designer, make an assumption. So within your design plan, you're going to be making assumptions about who your learner is, what grade level you're working on, what their prior knowledge is. You're going to be presenting that to us in the design plan, and then that will be our job to read through it and say, oh, okay, I get where you're coming from. However, could you tweak this? Could you go a different direction? And there's really, in my mind, there's not really any other way to do it except through your design plan, making that kind of line in the sand that this is who my learner is, these are my objectives, this is what I, the t content I'm going to teach, this is how I'm going to sequence it, these are the activities I'm going to do, and then trust this whole process of feedback coming back to you um, to refine things. Um, and, and Jill, I think this is a great time, maybe if you could step in and, and maybe add your two cents on how you approach this kind of decision point the designers are in right now, deciding where do I take this first step in designing um, this, this design, um, design plan document. Um, sure. Well, one of the things that I think, um, and I know I um, iterated to a few of you too when I was responding to your initial reflections, is that I always think it's really important that we remember that design is a recursive process. And so oftentimes you're going to find as we develop things, we're constantly going to be going back and revisiting things and double checking our work and checking with other people and getting feedback. And I think we've got a lot of opportunities um, to post information in the in the question forums um, for myself or Jennifer or any of you to to comment and respond to. Um, also, once we kind of get things going and seeing what everybody else is doing for the different modules, that will help. Um, what I would do is kind of just kind of jot down in bullet points kind of where you think this is going. Um, usually when I'm approaching design, I kind of treat it no different than if I were to write a paper for a school project. Just kind of jot down all the things that you think you might need to be factoring into your design. There's nothing wrong with posting rough designs, posting going, I think we're headed in this direction. What do you think? Um, sending that to myself or Jennifer or posting that for Kim and Courtney to take look at um, on, the, on the forum and everything for the facilitators, I think that's going to be really important because we're going to, we're constantly, probably what you propose and what you think you're initially going to design during that first iteration is probably going to look a lot different than what the final product's going to be. And, and that's okay. I think it's just a matter of just kind of jumping in, sketching something out and what you think it might look like, um, getting feedback on it and feeling free. I think it would be great if we can start sharing work too um, amongst the different groups. So even though you've all been assigned to individual units, being able to see what other people are doing, I think that will help as well. Um, another thing too that Jennifer and I can do, and if, and if this is going to be helpful for anybody, please let us know. Um, we can post some sample design plans um, for you so you can kind of see what they might look like or what they might entail. Um, they're going to be different and they'll be about, you know, for different learners and different topics, but just so you can kind of see how somebody would go about answering one of these, we can certainly provide you with a couple of samples as well as you, as you begin working on your designs. And this came up in one of the questions. Um, if you go to section five, in our minds, this, these are the eight, what we'll, we're calling for our purposes, the eight required sections of the design plan is laid out in section five of the jumpstart. And um, it's a written deliverable. And so again, this isn't where you're jumping right in and doing any type of prototype. This is really addressing those eight sections. And um, as far as logistics of it, if you prefer, since you're working with a partner collaboratively, if you want to write it in Google Docs and then um, turn it in as a URL link, that's fine. Or if you prefer to work in Word, that's fine. Whatever works best for your teams, as long as it's the written document. Um, but, um, and Jill, also, if you could touch on this whole idea, and I, I don't want to like beat a dead horse here, but I, it, it, to me, I think this is the crucial part for the designers where you don't know where to start. Like some of these questions that we're getting now are like, you just have to start somewhere is kind of my answer I've been giving people, which I know kind of falls flat, <laughs> but I think it's sort of the answer. It's kind of like you were saying, you sketch out some things that you know you want to do, but um, there's really no way for us to offer feedback to blank pieces of paper. So we just kind of ask you to start someplace and get the dialogue going with us. Do you have any other pearls of wisdom on that, <laughs> on that front, Jill? Um, sure. Uh, well, one of the things I would say is um, 
what, I know one of the sections in the design plan is asking you to kind of describe your learners. And so that's something that you can easily pull from the Jumpstart materials and from these webcasts because I know we keep talking about it over and over again. And so I think just keeping that in mind, that's going to help. Um, then I would look back to whatever unit you were assigned. I would go into the Jumpstart materials again where we kind of have that bulleted list of what some of the different topics would be and what we would want you to expect. And, on. and then from there, you can kind of start looking at um, maybe focusing in on um, if you've got Unit 3, does that look like there might be four? Um, I'd kind of divide up and like, what do you think the mini lessons might be? Do you think there might be, or what are the, what are the main topics for unit, for unit 4 or Unit 5 or whatever unit that you have? Um, and just constantly kind of just go back and forth with remembering what the learners are, going back and revisiting those, those GRE type test questions just to kind of get some ideas. Um, and again, we're expecting um, your design, um, Pro, your design plans to be rough prototypes, and it's really just kind of to um, kind of start thinking about where are you headed with your design. And, and Jennifer and I will be giving you lots of feedback on those sections before you even jump in to actually designing any of the activities and any of the materials. But it's really just starting to think about how many types of questions are you going to pose um, for your for the mini lessons or the mini topics that are embedded in your unit. Um, well, that's how I would do it. I would constantly, if it were me and I was working on one of these units, I would be revisiting the Jumpstart materials and kind of putting in all the information that I already know. And a lot of it's going to be, most people should have very similar responses for who are the learners because we're all developing units for the same people. But it's just to, as a constant reminder for you, who's our central focus on this project? Yeah. Um, any may, other uh, May I make a suggestion? Yeah. Uh, Jennifer? I was just, I was just okay. going to ask you to do the same thing, please. Okay, so this is Bonnie, and I work at uh, work with the people at uh, Race Centers. And uh, one of the things, uh, as an instructional designer and, and guiding in that process, I would suggest also that that you constantly keep those objectives that have been stated in mind, and recognizing, uh, you know, if, if when Jill talked about the topics, which topics come off of each one of those objectives. And then uh, I, I sort of almost do it like a spider web, you know, as uh, which topics come off of each one of those objectives, and then which each activities, what activities. So I ask myself questions. Okay, what are these? What are my objectives? What are the topics that come off of each of these objectives? And then what are the uh, activities, practice activities? And then uh, uh, you know uh, the way in which I would uh, uh, in, instruct that, as well as the practice activities. So that's. Uh, I'm sure when I say a spider, you you know what I'm talking, sort of like a, a fish diagram or a spider diagram. Yeah. Okay? And this kind of gets to the point, and I know I'm really beating a dead horse here, but to me this is the heart of design. And if you talk to Monica Tracy, who's one of our directors, she calls this like process like kind of the design thinking. It's inherently messy. You have to start somewhere, put, start putting stuff on paper. Um, I know I read and a lot of people were saying these objectives aren't specific enough. Well, that's kind of your role then as a designer to make them more specific to apply to the, the unit you're designing. And you have all the freedom in the world to start doing that process. So, um, Yeah, the, the objectives were stated as, uh, as the terminal objectives for the end of the lesson. So there can be some, uh, you know, some en enabling objectives that would go underneath each of, each of those objectives. So, uh, I mean, we, we didn't want to make the objectives uh, 20 long because under each kind of, ter of a terminal objective, you generally have three or four uh, enabling objectives that are inherent in that lesson. And then moving on um, to Kim and Courtney, if you guys could help us on this piece. I, I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. So we've had lots of questions about lengths uh, of the unit, which I think is very natural when the students are starting to dig in. You're like, wow, I've got a lot of content to cover. How in the world are we going to do this? And it really was your intent that each of these units, right, is one hour maximum, which would include all presentation, demonstration, practice, and assessment activities, right? And do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Or maybe give us a little bit of a sense for how this actually works in, in real life, in real practice? I think um, with the exception of the assessment activity, so if they were to have, if they were to have something that would be a supplemental uh, worksheet, for example, that they design, um, you know, that could be outside of that hour. That would be fine. Yeah. But I think uh, as far as their attention span, to uh, one topic, an hour would probably would be the maximum for them to go through. 
and to uh, to look at the presentation stuff, you know, the demonstration, the practice. Like I said, if they have an additional assessment that they would like to do as a supplement, I think I think that's fine to be over an hour, or we can even assign it as homework for the student. Yeah, yeah, and and Kim, what I I had suggested earlier too is that I mean the assessment activities that are included within the hour are those short questions or uh, practice items that uh, yeah. may or may not be tracked. But then, if there's a like you said, if there's a long assignment, a, a worksheet, or an essay, it's going to take them you know anywhere from seven to thirty minutes. Uh, they're going to have to do that outside of the lesson. But they can still include yeah. that. In yes. fact, it would be helpful to include that. Yes, it would be very helpful. OK, well, I think um, I am hitting most of the, that was a hard one to get out, most of the questions that have come at us. Um, so are there any, anyone would like to unmute their mic? I know, Sean, you. Um, and Ensign are working on a slightly different deal. You're doing Unit 7, which is the redesign. Um, are there any questions, Sean, that you have um, as far as in this, uh, this prior screen we talked about applies to you as well, taking that kind of macro unit you received and then chunking it down into more manageable one-hour chunks. But does Sean or anybody else have any questions that we haven't covered yet? This is Sean. I don't have any questions. Okay, good. Good, good. Um, is there anything that we're missing? Oh, I know. Let's talk about this a little bit. Helen, this was your question also. You had a part B, which I, we glossed over here. Um, let's talk just a little bit about our development. Um, and we talked a little bit before about having the, that we're developing in PowerPoint, which I know it's boring and yuck, but <laughs> that's, what, that's what we're doing uh, for the, looking to the future. Um, and so, this brings up then and begs a lot of questions because it's a constraint for you as designers for how much interactivity you're able to have on the screen and you're having to push them offline to do things and what have you. Um, so then it comes up also then, well, what can we do in terms of maybe having a video they watch or some audio? And um, as far as I'm concerned, and I would like Kim and Courtney's opinion on this, um, is it appropriate for the, your students to be able to click a button and watch a video? You certainly have all that capability, right? We've talked about that before. They love watching videos. Okay, well that's a good. <laughs> that, was the answer. that was good. And then images and videos and um, and things like that. And I've kind of been on my soapbox on prior sessions. Also, there's such just this wealth of open educational resources that's Creative Commons licensed. So if if it's something is applicable, you know, go for it. Bring it in, embed it in yours if you're able or or link to it. So I think that addresses some of the questions that um, that Helen had. And then um, just kind of big picture thing also, just don't, don't worry about, you know, develop to your own ability. Don't worry about the fact that you're not able to create your own videos. If, or if you are, more power to you and feel free to take on that initiative to, to de develop things. But there can be some fantastic lessons and instruction that's primarily text-based that just is peppered with relevant visuals. And as Kim's talking about linking to some relevant videos that may be out there. Um, but we'd far rather you do that than try to go beyond your abilities or start using like irrelevant materials that kind of just jazz things up or you know, using clip art or something that doesn't make sense for what you're trying to do because you have this perception that it's not very jazzy what, what you're putting together. That, that sometimes comes up. Um, any other thoughts? I know, Bonnie, this was kind of a, a hot button of yours when you were putting the style guide together. Anything that I'm missing on this point as far as development? Uh, I, I think with uh, with the visuals, sometimes people think relevant means I'll put in a picture of a person that looks like my audience, like my audience. <laughs> and and that's not that's not the relevance you're talking about. The relevance is that you're looking for those things. I'm sorry if you can hear that. Okay. Um, that we're looking for anything that is particularly visual to the content, not. Uh, you know, so it, I call the other sort of decorative, uh, decorative uh, visuals. You don't want something that just uh, is there that uh, that you think is relevant. It needs to be to the content, uh, specific to that content. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Courtney and Kim, I kind of like to give you guys a, a chance to add anything that you want us to think about now that you've had a little bit more time to work with students. Is there anything? 
um, that you want to make sure that we're uh, doing or thinking about? Um, I think for all of the um, the design students, if you just um, you know just start out directionally correct, we'll let you know if it's you know if it's hitting the mark for us and what we need. So I don't I don't think the pressure is on for anything to be perfect, especially in the beginning. But that's that's a term I always use. As long as we start out directionally correct, <laughs> we'll be able to to help you or to push you in a different direction to. If, if you're off base of what we're looking for. so, And that is something I'm not sure we mentioned. When you turn in your design plans, Kim, Courtney, and Bonnie will also get copies and, and have the opportunity to offer feedback. So it's not just Jill and myself. Um, Jill? Yeah, and as you, go through, as you go through and you're looking at stuff, if there's something that you have more questions about, please don't feel like you're bothering us to ask, you know, ask some more detailed questions. We're happy to answer them. Um, Jill, did you have any other thoughts as far as, um, or, or any questions? Floor is open for questions as well. Um, Jennifer, also for Sandy and Gilbert, I believe that's, those are the two working on the probability um, or combination presentation. Yes, the, first, the second one, yep. Comment, yep. Okay, um, Courtney can email some stuff out to them that might give them some more clarity. That'd be great, yeah. Okay, and I think we have their email information on the contact information on the website, right? Yep, and as soon as we're done here, I'll just send you a quick email too, um, just so you have that. Oh, beautiful, okay. So she can get that out to them, and, and I think that might add some clarity to that. Okay, um, and I'm just going to do my last pitch, and Jill, feel free to chime in. Um, as, as of going into the this morning, I had six of the 13 that I saw the reflection twos. I cannot tell you from a facilitator's standpoint how valuable those are for us. It may not seem like a big deal as you're writing it, but it definitely allows us to make necessary adjustments and answer questions before they become bigger questions. Um, and so, Jill, did you have any other thoughts on that in terms of, I know this is kind of your baby for a lot of different reasons, but it's not just for our purposes, it's also for you as designers, hopefully taking a moment to take stock in what's happening. Did you have any other thoughts on that, Jill, before we leave that? No, I just wanted to um, thank everybody. I think everybody did a really good job on that first reflection, and it really helped myself and Jennifer um, get a better understanding of where you're at, too. And, and we know a lot of people um, are, are new to designing this. A lot of you haven't worked with a population such as this one. A lot of you are new to designing online instruction. And so we just want you to know we're well aware of that and not to worry about that. We can kind of help you along the way this semester, and you can improve on some of those performance goals that you set. Um, that's what um, then Jennifer and I will, will feel this has been a successful project as well, not just developing the materials for Grace Centers of Hope, but also helping you um, on your design journeys as well. So um, continue to let us know when you're, when you're nervous or apprehensive or you need a clarification because that's what we're here for, and we definitely want to be able to provide you with the necessary support and resources that you're going to be successful on this project. Well, that's all I had. Um, I'm ready to wind down unless anybody else had any other questions. Okay. Well, I will get this recording posted this evening. I've got some stuff this afternoon. I've got to duck out of the house for a while, but um, I will post this this evening. And thank Kim and Courtney and Bonnie and, and all the students that are here today. I think it was a nice way to kind of bring everybody together and answer some questions. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Awesome, Bye thank now. you. Thank you. Recording of the conference has stopped.